everyone. It's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that we've always assumed your height is genetic, and it sort of is. But new research shows that it's only about 80% genetic, and the other 20% is nutrition and environmental factors. Better nutrition is something that we think is a reason that average height keeps increasing, but you might argue, and I probably would, that it's improved access to food. And since we eat more now, it's not necessarily that we're getting more nutrition. And as for the genetics, it looks like there's about 697 gene variants that impact your height. So if you're short, there's great hope for your children. But for you, well, you're probably still short. Likewise, if you're tall and you don't fit an economy section, that would be me. Um, there's no hope for you either. But hey, there are worse things than being tall. Today's guest is Holly Thompson, who's the creator of Nutritional Style, which is a health and nutrition blog and consulting company. She's a certified health coach and health professioner, health professional, and a Myers Briggs practitioner, which is really interesting. She's also a raw food chef, and I, if you've listened for a while, you know that I've been a raw vegan. Uh, that I'm not a raw vegan today, but that I've used a lot of the raw vegan cooking techniques uh, that I worked on in some of the bulletproof recipes as well. You can find Holly at hollythompson.com, and you'll also see her writing on Mind Body Green. Uh, by the way, shout out for those guys. Um, they're good friends. Uh, the Daily Love, hey, Mastin, love you back, and lesscancer.org. Awesome, Holly. You write for good people. But most importantly, you can check out Discover Your Nutritional Style, which is a new book that Holly released, and I just had a chance to look at an advanced copy. So, Holly, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So you've been a kind of former big time New York City corporate type who moved to the country and started a new career. Uh, how's, yeah. how's that going so far? <laughs> um, you know, it, well, I'm sitting here staring out at the absolutely most beautiful view in the world of a huge old historic barn against a sunset on the East Coast. And so I'd say it's going pretty well. Um, you know, it's uh, I didn't really intend to stay this long, maybe um, didn't wasn't quite sure how it would work out. But that's, you know, kind of the way life took me. And uh, I still get into New York pretty often, at least once a month. So yeah. nice. and more these days, more these days with my book. Yeah, I was in New York uh, two weeks ago uh, for my book and to meet with some some other friends out there. So no matter where you live, it seems like if you write books, you end up in New York pretty yeah. often. Yeah, absolutely. So I've done something similar. I'm looking out at the second most awesome uh, thing or view you could look at. It's uh, Vancouver Island. So I'm looking out over Salt Spring Island and some water uh, and building an organic farm where I live because I think that's one of the ways I know to increase my resilience is to live around beautiful stuff. Uh, right. So I'm working on it much like you are. Mm -hmm. What made you make your transition to looking at this nutritional, uh, nutritional typing sort of thing? What uh, what did this? Well, what happened was um, really right after I left New York and you know left my big glamour job in the city, um, I moved here to a farm and got sick and started to get all basically all kinds of things that I'd never dealt with in my life. You know, I was on a fast track in New York, flying all over the world, um, you know, running multi million dollar business, and basically you know held it all in. And I moved to the country and started to get um, incredibly like um, horrible migraines, debilitating migraines, where I was hospitalized actually three times in a year. Um, I also started to get allergy symptoms. I had never had allergies in my whole life. Uh, that kind of, both of those segued, in, segued into chronic sinus. So I ended up with seven sinus infections in one year. So I was basically, you know, living on, every time I would, one of these things would happen, I would be at the doctor and living on a fistful of pills, living on antibiotics. Um, finally, that one year when I had seven in one year, I was, I felt great on the antibiotic and horrible off of it. So when you get to the point where an antibiotic is your feel-good drug, you know you've got to do something about it. And, um, you know, my immunity was compromised, basically. Um, I had thrown off my healthy gut bacteria. So um, 
so I also started getting sick all the time. You know, every every virus, every cold that came around was sick. I would get sick. Um, it, it affected my fertility. I wanted to have a baby at that time. And, um, you know, I couldn't, I could get pregnant, but not keep the pregnancy. So it was a very, um, you know, it was a sad time. And, uh, and then it went through, you know, several miscarriages, which threw my hormones off. And this cycle went on for several years, Dave, um, where... I was just, I felt like I was on a roller coaster. I eventually adopted my son. Um, my son is from Russia and that was a wonderful thing. And um, within months of bringing him home, I broke into this viral rash, which was mononucleosis. And, and you know, and then what was still getting all of the other things, you know, chronic migraines. And I, you know, here I was with this new baby, but then living in fear that a migraine would strike or a sinus would strike, whatever. So um, went through this lovely period for several years and finally um, decided to take my health in my own hands. And I had always been interested in nutrition, a student of nutrition, um, had kind of spent all my free time at, you know, not just health spas to lie around, but, you know, to hike and work with people and work with holistic, pract holistic practitioners and get into alternative medicine. So I really turned back to that, you know, after years of trying Western medicine, really turned back to that and realized that there was something in my diet um, that wasn't right. And it wasn't like I was eating a bunch of junk food or processed food. I, I really felt that the way to my healing was going to be through my food. And, you know, when people get sick or when you feel awful or when you're sick, it's, it is very difficult to care about your food or it's difficult to do what you need to do. And you, you know, you, you know that, or you may have worked with people and, you know, we think people that are very sick that are, that need our empathy and need our help to get them good food because, you know, in America, I mean, here we are, what we have to grab if you're not feeling well is not healthy and is not yeah. what we should be, right? And it's not what we should be eating if we don't feel well. So I had actually gotten to that point, even knowing what I knew, um, where I was grabbing what was there and it was not working. So I, I, pulled myself up by my bootstraps and basically recognized that my immunity was compromised and found a holistic nutritionist, really did the nutrition piece myself. Um, this person was fantastic at compounding um, supplements, which I did need at the time. I, I was so you know weakened by everything, but really did the food piece myself. And after going through that, and then coincidentally, my son going through a period like that where he all of a sudden developed asthma and went from being a healthy, robust little boy to being very sickly, um, kind of worked with him the way I did. And the thing that we had in common was that we were both dairy intolerant. We both had an intolerance to dairy that was creating an inflammation that was at the root cause of all of those things. And once I figured that out for myself, and then subsequently my child, who's my adopted child from Russia, and it made sense, right? It made sense for his genetics that he might have an issue with dairy. Um, you know, it changed everything. It changed everything for me. And I realized that I needed to share this, that it was something that was profound in my life, in my child's life. If I hadn't done this work, if I hadn't done the hard work of figuring this piece out, I would, I don't know where I would be. I would still be, you know, back there so many pounds heavier and chronically sick all the time and basically living, you know, not living the life that I was meant to live, not feeling the way I'm meant to feel. And my, you know, my son too. So that was my, my big, you know, moment, my big aha moment was really when it came down to my child. And when I saw what he went through, you know, with the permission of a, a medical doctor um, and saw how changing his diet, removing all dairy from a little kid's diet, which is a tough, can be a tough thing for a mom to do, right? Um, and it was profound. So I ended up going back to school and my mission became to share, um, share good health and how to find good food in America. And, you know, that came through natural cooking school. It came through going back and getting certifications that I needed and wanted to work with people and coach people. And, um, you know, the rest is history. I started Nutritional Style about five years ago and then um, have been working on my book 
discover your nutritional style um, for the past couple of years. So, that's so it. We, we have a few things uh, in common there. Uh, you know, you've okay. had fibromyalgia and chronic migraines and allergies, and I, I've had all of those things. I lost yeah. 100 pounds and uh, chronic sinusitis for 15 years. Wow. So making antibiotics that make you feel better and all. Yeah, and inflammation. Yeah, inflammation is, is underlying everything. And yeah. and for me, one of the, the surprising things that I found, and, and I, this is top of mind because I finished shooting a documentary. We just wrapped the final shoot uh, three days ago, a documentary on environmental molds and how you know, like a, a moldy house can actually trigger dairy allergies and can trigger mm -hmm. asthma and migraines and all that. And I, I sort of went back and I'm like, wait a minute, when I was a little kid, I was inflamed and I had nosebleeds all the time and like frequent bruising and I had all these signs and I lived in a water damaged basement. And I realized that the environment, even when I was a young, you know, very young, you know, two, three year old kind of, kind of boy, I didn't, uh, like my parents didn't know, I didn't know, but I had all these things going on, the asthma, the rashes and all that. And mm -hmm. What did that do to my gut biome? What did that do to my whole like life, lifespan, whole like evolution, and uh, the way my body grew? So I, I think it had an effect. And when I was re-exposed, my dairy allergies went through the roof compared to where they used to be. It's kind of interesting. Very interesting. Do you think that there was a trigger when you when you left New York because you handled dairy well in New York, or were you not healthy in New York either? You know, I was um, I was managing chronic sinus but not to the level of when, after I moved. Um, I think I think one of the triggers being here in Virginia, first of all, it's a different climate. Yep. Um, it is moist, it is humid. Um, and, you know, everyone says if you move to Virginia, everyone who moves to Virginia gets allergies of some kind. Mm -hmm. Plus, uh, you know, plus we were living on a farm. So, you know, you're exposed to all kinds of things. I actually had a doctor say to me, um, well, some people just shouldn't, you know, shouldn't retire. Some people shouldn't jump <laughs> off the fast track. And, you know, when you're when you're in the hospital and you've got a migraine so that they have you on a morphine drip, like you really don't want someone to tell you that. Yeah. Um, but I think that's interesting that about the, uh, you know, about the mold and mold and yeast is, I mean, it's powerful stuff, you know, um, that's very interesting. How would you develop nutritional style? I mean, uh, one question, and I have to admit, I'm just not remembering this uh, from having gone through your book. Uh, like there's always a question about candida and do you yeah. use, uh, say, like uh, nutritional yeast in food? Uh, yeah. Or, or do you not? Right? Where, where do you come down from a nutritional style perspective? Like, like help people who are listening understand you know, how are you thinking about what is nutritional style and, and how you would approach something like nutritional yeast versus you know, canola oil versus some other kind of food? Uh, so specifically nutritional yeast or, or just candida in general? Well, let's just walk through what, talk what, about... what's your approach to nutritional style and then let's okay. zoom down to a couple foods like that. Okay, so so the, my basic premise for what is your nutritional style, discovering it, is that we're all different. And so what works for me um, might not work for even my sister or my mother or my best friend. And what started to happen in my practice, you know, after working really with hundreds of women in groups and individually, is that I started to hear over and over women coming to me saying, oh, well, you know what? I mean, I know I should eat this way, but my friend just did this diet and she lost all the weight and I want to try that. And so I saw, I started to watch women in particular, but guys too, jump from styles, one style of eating to another without tuning into what was working for them and what their body was doing on a, on a, on a very basic level. So when, if you bring up something like candida, um, you know, if you are, if you're eating one way, let's say you're on a vegetarian vegetarian diet, classic vegetarian diet that has maybe a lot of grains, beans, legumes, whatever, and fruits, and um, and you're not feeling great, but you're doing it because you're determined to not eat animal protein, you know, that's not working for you. Um, I mean, and, and, and the same, you know, the same thing for people, a lot of women now come to me and in fact, I, I just came from a meeting with a client who is a f white knuckle fighting to be a raw vegan. And as you, I think you said you were a raw vegan for a while. I was a raw vegan for a while. I write about it in my book. 
I felt absolutely fabulous as a raw vegan until I no longer did. Yeah, about three and, months, thereabouts? Uh, you know what, longer, longer. Okay. I was like, you know, I was white knuckling and I was actually coming into my second winter and basically stealing food from my kid's plate and my, you know, my husband, I'm like making these delicious like winter stews for my family and cooking seasonally and then trying to be a raw vegan in Virginia when there's, you know, three, foot of, three feet of snow outside. It wasn't working. And so what started to drive me crazy were women like that, you know, because I had gone through this, who were determined to try a particular style of eating and white knuckling it through it when it was clearly not working for them. So that's a, that's a, the, that's really my entire premise is that we're all different. Some things work really well for some people and some things don't. And by tuning into our own bodies and what works for us, um, we can discover our unique nutritional style and it can change. It can evolve. It can evolve as we grow older. It can evolve if we move. It can evolve with the seasons and should evolve with the seasons. And um, and I just got really, uh, really passionate about this because so many people were trying to do something that wasn't ultimately right for them because somebody else told them to do it. So uh, I, and I started to see three different styles of eating emerge from the clients that I was working with. Um, one is what I call a healthy omnivore, which is someone who freely eats animal proteins and, but yet um, we try to make them the healthiest omnivore possible. So that might be that might be, you know, being dairy-free, gluten-free, but needing lots of vegetables but having animal protein in their diet. Um, another was what I call a flexible vegetarian, so very much a vegetarian diet where they can they can tolerate some grains and some legumes and, you know, sort of a traditional vegetarian diet. But yet, um, but yet, if they want to have a piece of fish, it's not the end of the world. You know, like it's it's. I like to say it's food not religion. Is it true that fish are the vegetables of the sea? <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, darn, I hope not. I'm just kidding. But, but no, there's so many I do love sea vegetables. <laughs> there's so many, um, so many vegetarians who are willing to eat fish. It's like, well, you're not actually a vegetarian really, but it's good that you're eating some fish because you'll get some omega-3s. It's like, it's okay. Like, you're not a bad person. I know. It's like, and that was what was driving me crazy. It's like, it's like, you know, you're not like the, the earth is not going to stop moving just because you ate a piece of fish or, you know, you ate some grass fed meat or, you know, some people who are trying to be vegans and, you know, they might have some fermented cheese or they might have like a piece of salmon or whatever. And they, you know, it's like, they'll say, well, I'm a vegan and we'll go through their meals and, there's animal protein all over the place. And I was like, well, you technically are not a vegan, you know, like, let, like, let's just drop that, drop that label. And so discovering your nutritional style came out of that. It came out of working with all of these women. And, and what I'm really passionate about is helping people find out and figure out what works for them, you know, which, which foods and work and don't work. And I think it's just as important to know what doesn't work as it is to figure out what does. In, uh, in the Bulletproof Diet, I do this roadmap uh, and uh, a book coming out. I have a list of kryptonite foods, and it yeah. shared an awful lot in common with your list of you know, dangerous liaisons, your, your toxic right. and potentially dangerous foods. What are the foods that are toxic and dangerous on, on your program? You know, the serial killers, GMOs, processed foods, trans fats, um, you know, processed corn syrup, um, Processed sugar. I mean, processed sugar is the devil. You know, the artificial sweeteners are the devil. Um, and uh, I think if any anybody, no matter what you're eating, if you can get those things out of your diet, you're you know you're halfway there, really. Um, and, but for a lot of people, incredibly, it's incredibly difficult even with the knowledge and science behind it. Um, and then I get into what I call the bad boys of nutrition. And those are some of the inflammatory foods that are commonly inflammatory in a lot of people. So that might be, that's like your dairy, your gluten, your soy, um, you know, your sugar, processed foods, nightshades. And I think we, I mean, I think we all owe it to ourselves to figure this piece out and to find out 
you know, do you, do you have a legitimate dairy intolerance? Do you have a gluten intolerance? And, you know, I've, you probably have found this too, but so many people don't want to come face to face with that reality. You know, like they, they are usually, usually they're the ones to tell me like, oh, I need all this help and I can't lose weight and I feel awful. My energy's low. And the first thing out of the mouth is, you know, I just can't give up bread. And yeah. I'm like, bing, gluten intolerance. Uh, but, can you say addict? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And these foods are addictive. You know, they are, you know, they're physiologically ad- addictive to most people. They're producing different things in their bodies that their body continues to want. And so, um, you know, but for me, the the big, um, you know, it's it's mystifying that people often know and will come to me and tell me. And then, and then we will work together over time to really, a lot of the work I do is getting people to actually accept that food is as powerful as it is and that it does have as a profound effect on your body as, as we're saying it does. It's one of those things where, where we've almost been taught over the last 40 years that exercise is, is more important than food. You eat whatever you want. As long as you exercise enough, you're a good person and you'll be thin. And I'm like, I'm a 300-pound guy. And like, I don't know, I, I work out like 15 minutes a week and I, I do some weird electricity stuff. But I look better now than I did when I was 18 or 25. Um, and it's all food. Like, really, exercise isn't that big of a variable. Like, it's, it's like 5% for me. Right. Right. Me too. Me too. I mean, as long as I move and do something, I feel great and I feel toned. And I think that I think food has a lot to do with your skin tone and food has a lot to do with your muscle tone, you know, because you're because you're if you're feeding your your body the right fuel, your body's producing healthier cells, you know, and your body is you're going to look younger and you're going to be more toned and you're going to look, you know, your skin's going to be more clear and it shows. So I totally agree. I have a lot of people come to me who, who exercise too much, who are overtraining and then trashing their bodies with, you know, the wrong foods, as you said, and then, and they're the ones, you know, they have like these amazing physiques, but they look probably 10 years older than they need to, you know? How do you diagnose overtraining in, in someone who comes to you looking for diet help, but clearly has I'll just say an exercise problem or a stress problem, really, which is what, how that manifests. It absolutely is. You know, I can, I like, I think I can usually see it on their face. I mean, if you, you know, you, you, you can see it. I mean, you can kind of see that over, overtrained. Um, usually, the skin is very dry um, because they are, you know, they're not. Their their body is in a constant state of inflammation and repair. And so they're they they're not giving. You can tell if they're not giving their bodies the correct nutrients to re, you know to cool all of that inflammation. If you're not giving your body a break, if you're not adding some balance in, um, yeah. I mean, you're you're usually usually the face. I mean, you see you see it in wrinkles and dry skin and bumpy skin, and um, they don't have that glow that they want, but they have great bodies. Yeah, it's easier when you're young. Um, that's that's for sure. I uh, I have a, a good number of people who come to me who are phenomenally successful. They're like around thirty, and you know they've they've burned a lot of their sort of youthful vigor, and they're like running companies and they're running you know Ironmans and and training. And it's like you no know, guys who are professional triathletes, they like train and sleep, and that's all they do. And they eat, train, sleep, and to try and put that on top of running a company and being a young parent and all that stuff, it, it does come from somewhere. And, and you know, maybe you want to, it comes from your chi. Uh, like right. you, you can only right. do it for so long before you start to break. And then you yeah. can see it in their face is, is what you're saying. Yeah. And their chi is not unlimited, you know? Do you use lab testing uh, for food allergies? You know, I don't. Um, I know a lot of you know a lot of nutritionists do. I don't. I do. I like. I think that even if even if I were to, I think the best way to tell is to do it yourself, and remove the food completely two to three weeks, and then add it back in. <laughs> and when you do that, it's like, ah, hello. Yeah. You know, guess who has a dairy intolerance or you know whatever it is. Um, but you know, again, the the crazy thing with that is that. A lot of people still, and the smartest people in the world, will still get in there and try to figure out how it possibly could have happened and not have been what they just worked two to three weeks to prove. 
<laughs> you know, like that, I, I'm not kidding. Like the smartest people in the world will say, well, do you really think so? You know, I mean, I did have a stomach ache when I ate that bread, but gee, I don't know because, you know, I've had a whole lifetime of not having a stomach ache. And it's like, whoa, that's the whole, you know, the whole reason you went without bread for two or three weeks and then added it in is so that you can see how you, you know, genuinely react to this. But it's I, I, funny. I try to overcome that resistance in people using uh, using the data. And, and if they don't use the, the blood test, I put out a free app called Food Detective that looks at your heart rate after a meal. And if you eat something you're, you're sensitive to, your heart rate elevates above 16 beats per minute. So you can get like the, the rationalists who are like, well, it's something else. But then if they had bread four meals in a row and it always elevated, they can't say, well, I had coffee that meal and I ran the next meal. Like they run out of excuses after a while. Like, okay, like I guess the data is kind of in and, and they have to face reality because they have a mirror and the mirror is in the form of data versus the, the mirror that you can see when you look at them and like their face looks broken. Like right. you can see someone who's drained. Um, but it, it's, it's like a delicate dance when someone really doesn't want to give up their drug of choice, which may be gluten and maybe dairy protein, casein, uh, and it could be corn or sugar or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. What's your app? We need, we all need your app. It's called a food detective. It, it's on the iPhone only. I'm working on the Android version, but awesome. it, it's free. I'm like, I just want people to yeah. not walk around inflamed all the time. So I'm not trying to sell anything here, but it, it, yeah, it's yeah. no, no, thing. but no, yeah. I want to share. I mean, I'll be oh. sharing this with my, my people. I want, thank you. Yeah, no, no, no. We need to share that. I think it sounds great. There, there's so much you can do when, when you get rid of the baggage of all these allergies, because as you know, cause you've done it for yourself. It's like your willpower that you were holding, uh, that you were using that willpower to, to push against something. Like you remove all those inflammation things and all of a sudden, like, I don't have to push that hard. Like I, right. I, have, I can move more things now. Yeah. And, and for me, you know, as an entrepreneur and a dad and a guy who didn't have that when I was younger and I had to have it now, like, this is kind of fun. Like I'm having a party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that um, once you get once you do remove those things and you get to that point, as you said, it's easier to sustain. Like people say, well, how do I do it? And oh, it's so difficult. And oh, I just don't have the energy for that. And it's like, no, you know, I mean, it's like anything else. It's like a muscle. Once you once you know how to do it and you make it a part of your life, then it's easy, you know, and you feel so good and you feel like crap when you don't that, you know, you know, what's the option? Like, why do you want to feel like crap? So, yeah, once you recognize not feeling crappy, that really motivates you to feel good. And that yeah. was, was my experience as well. But yeah. you do something else that, that I'd love to chat about. You, you talk a lot about cleansing. So, yes. so the way you do cleansing, like how do you do a cleanse? What, what is a cleanse according to a nutritional style approach? So, you know, so just like in the same way that people have different nutritional styles and different ways of approaching what they eat or their diet, um, if we do a cleanse together, you know, I break my cleanse into different levels. So if you are coming to me from a processed food, you know, you're eating fast food or you're not eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and you're coming to me eating a lot, eating animal protein three times a day. So we're going to do definitely a whole food cleanse. Um, you know, I, I think I don't believe in taking that person to, I think taking that person to a juice cleanse is kind of crazy and would make them very sick and then unhappy. And, you know, basically they'd come out of the juice can, cleanse and be ravenous for food and you've lost the whole ball game. So um, I generally prefer to do whole food cleanses. Um, if someone is already, you know, if it's already almost vegan, then we might add in more liquid nutrition than, than if they, you know, if they're uh, an omnivore and eating meat three times a day. Um, I do like the idea of giving the digestion a rest. I love the idea of removing those inflammatory foods that are, that are commonly inflammatory in most people. And the reason I love that is because it's, it's an self experiment and it's a way of discovering starting to discover what your nutritional style is and which foods are a problem for you. So we re I absolutely remove all of those inflammatory foods if the person can take it. Believe me, I've worked with people who couldn't take that. You know, their, their systems just wouldn't tolerate it, and again, they'd be sick. So you remove, remove the inflammatory foods. You eat good, you know, three meals a day. If you can do one liquid nutrition meal, great. Um, in the morning, terrific, maybe two, depending on where you are in your path. And um, 
and then, you know, go through that for a good two weeks. I like the two week method and then ease out of it and learn, you know, use the, um, what we talked about before about adding back in the inflammatory foods, use that technique to, to learn what your problem foods are. You know, is that, is it actually, is dairy a cereal killer for you or is gluten a, that, a problem for you? Um, and the interesting thing is those inflammatory foods are problematic for so many people that, you know, it's, um, it's rare to find instances where they're not. How about that? Uh, yeah. When you look at the total bucket of inflammatory foods, the odds of someone responding to at least one are yeah. very large. Yeah. And, and why is it invisible? Like, like people who have a food inflammation problem and, and aren't paying attention to this stuff, like, no, I feel fine. Why do they not see these foods that are causing inflammation? I mean, I think they've had a lifetime of it, you know, and they, they're they not putting the connection between maybe their acne and the pizza that they eat three times a week. Or, and so, you know, dairy, dairy is something I work with a lot of kids and moms with teenagers and, you know, dairy is something that shows on your face often if you're a teen, you know, moms and moms want to say, well, he's, you know, he says he he eats a lot of candy. Well, maybe, but I'd look at the pizza, you know, I'd take a look at the dairy. Um, And so I think it's, you know, again, it's just people believing that connection, um, not quite wanting to face that that interior, you know, internal inflammation is going to manifest as acne or wrinkles or dry skin or achy joints, early arthritis, sinus infections, migraines, um, you know, all the different, you know, those are, I have a whole list of, of what I call early warning signs that just, that tell you that, you know what, there's probably some low level inflammation going on and there, there very well might be something you can do about it with your food. Uh, and I think that is, you know, that's a key thing that I want people to get with this book. That's a, that's a really important message uh, that there's all these things. And, and if you're if you're colorblind, you'll not know you're colorblind because you've always been that way until you do a little test. And you're like, oh, wait, you can see a difference. I don't see a difference. And that's the thing that's kind of a, the gateway drug uh, to paying attention to yourself. You just need to feel really good for a couple of days and go, wait, like, could that be my normal state? And, and, and then start working towards that. Yeah. Yeah. I had a woman, I mean, I love this story. I've, I've had so many, so many people have a similar story, but this, this one in particular, we did a cleanse a year ago and this woman literally called me and she said, Oh my God. She's like, she said, I was driving to work and for no reason at all. She said, I just started laughing. And she said, I had this feeling like I am just so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be alive. And she said, and I started to say, say to myself, like, are you losing your mind? Like, am I going crazy? And she said, and then I realized, oh my God, it's the cleanse. It's the cleanse I'm on. Like, I feel so good. And it was after about four days on the cleanse when she had removed all inflammatory foods and discovered what was possible for her. You know, if we, if you go through life, I mean, so many people feel bloated and achy after they eat dinner and they think that's normal. They think that they're supposed to feel that way. And if you are eating, you know, there's, if you're eating something that is inflammatory, that's going to do it, you know, but then go have, um, I mean, I remember when I first had started to eat raw and vegan and first had like a raw vegan meal and I had eaten so much food, but I felt so amazing. You know, I felt so light and my gut felt so clear and, you know, I'll never forget that. We were, you know, we, we, I was with a friend of mine and we were just saying, wow, like, this is extraordinary. We just ate so much food. You know, this is a, a long time ago and, and yet we feel fantastic. Like there's no bloating. There's no, you know, there's no icky feeling. We wouldn't want to go lie down and take a nap. Um, and when you start putting those, you know, the cause and effect together for food, that's when stuff starts to happen, you know, when you start believing it. Yeah, it's uh, at this point, if you're still out there believing that food quality or the type of food you're eating doesn't affect how you feel, uh, you just have to say, like, you're not paying any attention at all because it's just there's just too much data. And if you pay attention, you can usually feel it. Yeah, yeah, Um, absolutely. well, Well, Holly, there's a question that I ask everyone who who comes on the show, and the question is, 
given all the things you've learned in your life, not just about nutrition and food, uh, what are the three most important recommendations you have to people who want to perform well every single day? What, what would you tell people is most important? Mm, um, you know, number one is to be happy. <laughs> I mean, you can eat all the great food in the world and you can run and you can, you know, have your fitness every day. But if you're miserable doing it, you are doing more harm than good. I really believe that. Um, and it come, kind of comes back to this white knuckle approach I talked about. If you are, if you're over training and you're over measuring your food and over obsessing about what goes in your mouth, it's not a good thing. Um, number two would be to get some movement in, you know, get some movement in every day. Um, your, you know, the, your food, I believe is your lifeline and it's the key to living a long, healthful life and being the best you can be, but your body needs to move. It was designed to move. Um, sitting is the new smoking and, um, get up, get out of your desk, you know, move. And then number three is figure out. Uh, your nutritional style, believe it, you know, believe, uh, believe your body. When your body tries to sell you, tell you something, listen to it and honor it because our bodies are wise, um, you know, and they they know what they want. They know what they need. If something is wrong, some, then, you know, take a hard look at your food. And if that doesn't work, try something else, but, um, and get help. You know, there are a lot of great, great health coaches, nutritionists, and a lot of fantastic advice. Nutrition is a new field. Uh, it's a new science. And, you know, as you, you know, as you have exhibited, we're learning more and more every day. So, um, but pay attention to what goes in your mouth. That's the key. Right. Wonderful advice, Holly. Where can people find more info about your book? Where do you want them to go to pick up a copy and, and check out uh, some, of, some of your work? Or like, just where can we learn more? Yeah, come meet me. Uh, come see me at hollythompson.com. And that is H-O-L-L-I-T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N.com. Um, you'll see a link to buy my book there. The book's available at Barnes & Nobles and on Amazon.com. It's called Discover Your Nutritional Style. Uh, there's a fun quiz to take on my site and, uh, you know, lots of weekly blogging and notes that go out. And I'm a connoisseur of I like to think of myself anyway as a connoisseur of all things, um, things healthy. So beauty products and even down to, you know, home cleaning products. I really believe in a holistic nutrition lifestyle. So, um, yeah, come visit me there. Love to see you. Thanks, Holly. Have an awesome day. Thanks, Dave. It's been great having, seeing you here. If you're looking for a way to know which foods are making you weak, check out the free app called Bulletproof food sense this app is free it's called bulletproof food sense and it's available on the iphone store i created bulletproof coffee because i've enjoyed coffee since i was a young man but sometimes i drink coffee and i'd feel really good and then i'd crash and then i'd feel good and i'd crash until eventually for five long dark years i quit drinking coffee until i realized it wasn't the coffee. It was the toxins that formed during the production of mass market coffee. I re-engineered the coffee process to create the bulletproof process that makes beans without the toxins that rob performance from you every single time you drink most coffee. 